So I was hoping you could start out by telling me a little bit about the journey that you and Ruth traveled on. Oh, well, my wife, when she was 46 years old, was mm -hmm. diagnosed with early stage breast cancer um, and had her initial treatment uh, with uh, both uh, the removal of the mass and ultimately uh, chemotherapy and radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, a few year, at that point, she was disease free, and a few years later, uh, she had a recurrence uh, in her spine and very rapidly developed uh, widely metastatic disease. And, she died about eight months after her first recurrence. Wow. And so you wrote about this experience throughout her care, is that right? Yes, uh, I wrote about her initial treatment uh -huh. uh, in a series of columns in the New York Times, uh -huh. and then, and all that was published uh, prior to her disease coming back, and then after it recurred and she died, I finally sat down and wrote about that experience as well. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the series and, and why you may have written it. Can you, looking back on it, was it a form of altruism to possibly help other people going through the experience or perhaps a way of self-preservation or something in between? Yeah, so in, by the series you mean the initial articles, presumably. Yeah. Um, so I, I have to be honest, I don't really know, I don't have a clear reason why I did it. Mm -hmm. um, I felt compelled to. Mm -hmm. I thought I was seeing things that as a doctor before my wife was ill I should have been more aware of mm. and the there was you know it was a bit of a special circumstance in the sense that she was a cancer patient at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center a place I had already been a doctor for more than right. 10 years so I had you know walked through those halls her doctors were my friends it was couldn't have been a more familiar environment, workplace, and healthcare interaction mm -hmm. than the one that we were experiencing as she as a patient and I as her spouse. Uh, and yet it was completely new, hmm. completely different. And I felt like I was seeing things and observing things and realizing a perspective that I should have had all along okay. and that I needed to communicate because I did have this sense that, wow, if it's eye-opening to me mm -hmm. in this, you know, very con confined kind of environment where I work and live, and, sure. uh, and even there it's eye-opening. I mean, what must this be like for other doctors, for other patients, and what's really going on kind of on the other side of the desk? Mm -hmm. And it was actually an interesting experience for a lot of reasons, uh, but one of them was when when you write in the New York Times, you know, that goes up on the internet and there's these comments and things like that. Sure. And people left a mix of comments. Some were very sympathetic to what we were going through, mm -hmm. but others were actually quite hostile and just sort of said, what's wrong with you, doctor? You've been doing this all along and you didn't realize what this experience was like. Right. And that, it, it caught me as odd. Yeah. Um, I wasn't hurt by it. I mean, if you write in a public venue, especially on the internet, you expect everybody to come out of the corners and say what they think, but uh, it was sort of interesting because that being berated like mm -hmm. that, the irony was I was already berating myself. Right. It's like, yes, you got the point. I have been doing this every day mm -hmm. and had no idea. Wow. And uh, so it was really, um, I thought it was worthwhile yeah. to write about and I feel like after the fact I've gotten some you know positive feedback sure. that some of the things I had to say I did resonate with other doctors mm -hmm. and in some cases with patients mm -hmm. uh, and I have to tell you I had way more material than I ever wrote I mean there were so sure. many aspects of it that I hadn't really understood what the human side was mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. until I had gone through it. You mentioned the human side so uh, was Ruth reading your columns before you sent them in? Was she oh. kind of the last editorial yes, she, stop? Yeah. She was the, as they say, the top editor. Yeah, that's, yes. yeah exactly. She, uh, yes, she read everything. She read it. All. I wrote it all as one, essentially one piece. Wow, okay. And then eventually segmented it right. into these f sections of 800 to 900 words right. uh, as, as uh, period, as mm -hmm. moments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and absolutely, she read the whole thing. She read it right before it went up. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, um, and she was she was thrilled. Really? Uh, yeah. I, it's 
um, you know, she was healthy, she was disease free when all this ran. And uh, yeah, I think she was really pleased that I had found something uh, constructive and potentially beneficial to do uh, with that whole very difficult experience. Sure. And I think, frankly, you know, different people are different. Some are very shy. I think she thought it was kind of nifty mm -hmm. that people were reading. It was more than nifty. She was glad that people were relating to her experience, mm -hmm. too, not just mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, the columns very much focus on my experience right. as a doctor, but I think it was validating for her. I mm -hmm. think it brought it into the light and much of what I talk about in that and as well in the New York Magazine article is about this sense that illness secludes you, mm -hmm. separates you from kind of the regular people. Mm -hmm. And I think that at least brought out this somewhat secret or private experience and she was never secretive about it. Mm -hmm. She was very open. I have breast cancer, I'm getting chemo, I mean very mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, it brought it out into the sort of regular world of people reading the New York Times, saying, okay, here's a person who went through this thing, it happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So I'm struck by the duality that you talk about of being a cancer doctor as well as being a caregiver for your wife, and, and that sometimes doctors aren't always honest with their patients. And I'm wondering why you think that duality may exist. Um, well, first of all, I think there's every doctor-patient interaction is different. Sure. Doctor, the doctor's different, the patients are different. Uh, but I think that it's, in general, easier and more expeditious to gloss over complexity and nuance. Mm -hmm. And it's also a lot easier in any particular visit to just talk about what the action plan is than mm -hmm. to talk about the effects of those actions. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we, I talk about in the column, it's something that, this is something I was well aware of long before I went through this experience, was this sense that, you know, we've created a world for ourselves as doctors where we can safely move amongst human suffering mm -hmm. without it destroying us. Mm -hmm. And any normal empathetic human would be. Mm -hmm destroyed eventually by mm -hmm. that and mm -hmm. I think some of my colleagues I think it is hard over time but we need a way to sort of do what we need to do and to be much more objective than you can be as a family member I wasn't ever supposed to be Ruth's doctor mm -hmm. uh, and um, that insulation comes at the price I think of transparency and clear communication mm -hmm. sometimes and I, it's I don't want to generalize. There's a sure. lot of patients, there's a lot of doctors out there, but I think there's certainly, at least in some contexts, uh, more unintentional uh, deceit mm -hmm. than, um, than is desirable. Let's talk about delivering bad news. What do you think, from your experiences as a physician and your experiences with your wife, is there a good time to deliver bad news? At one point you talk about not being ready to hear some of the information that was being delivered. And I think sometimes in this country we wait, we wait until the end is imminent, um, knowing very well that the data shows otherwise that that may not be beneficial to the patient. Is there a right time to deliver that information? Um, there, I don't think there's a right time, but I would, I mean nobody ever wants to deliver bad news and it's always kind of is difficult to receive it, but I think the waiting for the right time is, it's a bit of a bogey. Mm -hmm. uh, that as if the next day somehow it'll be less devastating, or as if some force will intervene and the news will magically be delivered, or some, a miracle will take place nice. and the facts on the ground will change. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think, I do feel comfortable saying that we are too slow. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, to deliver bad news. We're not particularly good at bracketing it within the context of what we're doing. And to me, to some extent, and now I'm going to sort of talk from a bioethical perspective, yeah. sort of undermines the whole notion of consent or sort of collaborative care that we expect or desire to have with our patients because we know things they don't. Mm -hmm. And we're parceling out that information in the bite sizes we think they can accept 
very little insight into even if those are the right sizes or timing. Mm -hmm. And I do talk about when Ruth recurred, she developed a back pain, sort of figured out what it was through some imaging tests. And her doctor told, we were in Argentina at the time, her doctor was in New York, doctor told her she was going to die over the phone. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, you're going to die, I have to go. I mean, it was delivered in a very sympathetic way and it was bracketed by what we can do. Mm -hmm. But the one message, actually, I actually haven't asked him, but I suspect if I asked him, what was the one message you want to make sure to convey during that conversation? Two messages, probably. He would definitely say, I wanted to make sure she knew she was terminal. Mm -hmm. And the other was that she had to get back because she had a risk of cord compression. So mm -hmm. I think as a practical matter, she sure. probably would have said that trumped it. But the, in terms of communicating where she was, that was the piece of information that she had to get and digest so that everything else could be seen through that lens. And I think I deeply admire that in him. It was mm -hmm. the perfect thing for her, as bad as the news was. She would have been furious if she had been even softly told something that suggested anything other than that if it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And that the notion that she would fly all the way back thinking one thing only to later find out that no, that was never the case, that you know, the treatment would cure her or something like that, or could. Um, it, was, it was really sort of an admirable moment of doctoring. And I got a lot of feedback about it from some of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Some of my colleagues talked to me after that too and said, you know, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like the right way to deliver that news. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, they're wrong. It was, it was exactly the right way. Mm -hmm. It was given the constraints that we were 8,000 miles apart or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was the way to do it. What have you learned now about the idea of delivering news that a patient is terminal that you didn't know back then when you were just a doctor? And could you have learned that back then or did you have to go through this process to, to kind of get there? Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think I needed to learn that. I think th what I watched her doctor do is consistent with how I would have wanted to handle that situation. And you know, as a doctor who works in intensive care units and takes care of people with serious lung disease, that, that felt intuitively right. Like mm -hmm. you have to frame what's going on therapeutically or diagnostically with what the overall situation is, what mm -hmm. the arc of the, of the illness is, what can be modified, what can't. Um, so that felt familiar to me, but the, it was still very different when it was my wife. And it was a hard reality. Mm -hmm. Not hard as in difficult, of course difficult, but hard as in immovable. Um, and that's very different from the experience of communicating that with a patient and then going on seeing your next patient or going home mm -hmm. or going to, for your tennis game. So how has this experience changed how you are as a doctor and how you are as just kind of a person? Um, well, the person part is, I mean, it's so complex, right? I've lost, I've lost my spouse. I've lost the mother of my son. Uh, it has not changed my outlook in life. Mm -hmm. I feel just as lucky to have met her mm -hmm. actually here in Baltimore um, 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, I feel just lucky to have met her mm -hmm. today as I did back then. And when she died, I felt unbelievably lucky. Mm -hmm. Not for the loss, but for the experience. Mm -hmm. You know, we travel through these life, lives together and that was a great piece of it for me, like a huge piece of it. And she brought me my son and um, so, and she said she felt lucky as well, which is kind of an interesting thing to say when you're dying young. For the trainee or the new physician or possibly for someone who's been practicing for a while, what did you learn about this experience that could possibly help others? There's a lot of pieces to mm -hmm. this, and I don't think there's an easy answer about how to be better doctors than many of us are. Mm -hmm. And it'd be easy to sort of 
spout some platitudes. You should listen to patients better. You should try and put yourself in their shoes. Uh, but, you know, and there's certainly no, like, solution like William Hurt acted out in The Doctor where he made all of his med students, I think, have colonoscopies or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. It's not going to get us there. Um, but I, I guess I generally think, and this isn't from my experience, it's from after our ex initial experience watching my trainees and watching the other doctors I was around, that generally underestimate uh, individuals who turn into patients ability to understand themselves and the world and their life trajectory and put these things in a bigger context than we allow them to. And it's, I quote in one of the columns, I can't remember which one, but Don Berwick, who was the Medicare administrator, mm -hmm. um, was giving a talk one day and he made this point, and I think he had taken the line from somebody else, I then took it from him, but he said, you know, I used to think of patients as, you know, guests in my hospital, and now I realize I'm a guest in their lives. Wow. And maybe that's not exactly what he said, but something like that. And that really resonated with me. I was like, yeah, and this is after I had been through this. I was like, yeah, that's right. Like we, and it's not ego, right? But like we waltz into patients' rooms and we think their life is about their illness mm -hmm. and what we're doing for them and how we want to help them. It's all coming from good places. Sure. And so we try and protect them in terms of how we explain their illness or leaving things out or using vague terms that you know, don't have concrete meaning necessarily. It could be there's wiggle room in how to interpret them, right? We don't say simple things necessarily like, you know, this disease will kill you if something else doesn't get you first, mm -hmm. or this disease will kill you and most people are dead by three years, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but the reality is it's in the context, that's a small part of these people's lives. And so they're able to frame, I, I think most patients can put into context more information than we give them and figure out where it all fits. And, you know, most people actually do realize they will eventually die. And I actually don't think you have to have a separate board certification to communicate that. And I, when I listen to my trainees, you know, back when I was on the wards, I would often pull them aside and say, you know, we would leave a patient's room, I did inpatient service mostly, and say, what do you think they heard from what you just said? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And usually the response is, the same exact thing they said in technical terms. And then I would usually say, well, let's go ask them. And then in uh, we'd go, okay. and that's not at all what they heard. Mm -hmm. Right, and it was a pressure packed situation. I'm standing there on top of them saying, articulate, right. for, answer this question, tell me this. Right. But it, in fact, you know, that, and then, you know, the sort of discussion is like, okay, let's figure out what the goal is of delivering this information. Is it perfunctory? Mm -hmm. like, I'm seeing the patient, I have to say I said this so I can write it in the chart and I move on to the next patient. Right. There's a big part of that and that, I get that. But like if we're actually gonna try and communicate this complex information, it's actually much more important that it's heard than that we say it. So I actually think that's kind of a useful exercise. Mm -hmm. And many doctors do that, I didn't make this up. Right? A lot of doctors do go through this drill where after they explain things to patients, they say, now tell me what I just told you. Right. And that can be a very uncomfortable moment, even when you do it well, uh, because patients feel like they're being quizzed, because they feel like they're put on the spot. Mm -hmm. But if it's done in the right way, with care, mm -hmm. with empathy, with this notion that I need to know if you heard this piece or that mm -hmm. piece, or let, let's go over this again. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a good way of, of reconciling mm -hmm what you're trying to communicate with what's being heard. And everyone will t tell you stories like this, of going into a patient's room, giving them all this information, walking out, this happened to me actually, seeing my attending, saying, well, did you tell them this? And I said, yeah, yeah, I explained the whole thing. He said, that patient doesn't speak English. <laughs> wow. It's like, 
really? They looked like they understood me. Wow. So that's how far it is. And I'm happy to, if I had written about that, somebody else would have commented about what a dope I was, not being aware of it. And that's true. Mm-hmm. But it's, there's not much of a distance between not speaking English and not understanding medical jargon. Do you think you can teach medical students to be empathetic? Is that something that is intrinsic, or is that something that can be a taught skill? Um, yeah, you, you lecture at them, and then you give them a multiple choice test. Isn't that how we teach medical That's students? That's exactly things? right, yeah. Um, it doesn't teach empathy, though. <clears throat> It, it's not a fair question, right? I mean, that it's uh, medical students and house staff and, in fact, junior faculty and people before that, they do a lot of modeling. Mm-hmm. And so there is a, there's a bit of a tautology here, right? But we probably need our doctors whom they are emulating to show them these basic skills, not teach them. And mm-hmm. the question is, where do these doctors come from if we're growing up a generation that lack them, but I don't want to overgeneralize. You know, this is a big part of being a good physician educator, and we clearly identify some doctors as critical in playing that role, and I don't have a better answer than that, but uh, I'm pretty sure you can't teach it in a lecture course, but I, mm-hmm. I had a few experiences in my life before, before I was married, and then when my wife was sick, that brought some notions up that I paid attention to, and I think that most people would mm-hmm. if they sort of confronted it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and the story I told you, just literally thinking I'd had a conversation with somebody who didn't understand a word I said, and finding that interaction to be satisfying by my own perspective really woke mm-hmm. me up. Mm-hmm. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your role as just a husband. Can you be just a husband when you're going through this with your wife, if you're a physician? Um, I just had my version of trying to be a good husband, and I think everybody brings to it different, you know, strengths and weaknesses, if you will, or mm-hmm. faces different challenges. I had a unique challenge, or, which is that I knew exactly what was going on at this level of detail and through my own experience that sure the knowledge gap between us was was vast. Uh, and that was a horrible way, horrible place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I'd been better off being naive because I think then I would have felt completely out of control. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead what happened was I felt in control, not of her illness but of the knowledge around it. And I felt that driving a wedge between us because really? of because I knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. And I knew, and I wrote about this, I, I think I said I could see the future. I knew that, I think they took the metaphor out, but um, our lives had been sort of twined together. And I could see that kind of one of the th- threads was gonna stop and the other one was gonna go on. Wow. and. I knew it with certainty, Mm -hmm. not because some doctor had told me, because I had watched it happen. And I had watched my own patients and other patients. I had watched husbands go to the elevator for the last time, leaving their dead spouses behind. Mm -hmm. Not once, but many times. Not just from breast cancer, from other cancers, from other illnesses. I had watched that separation at that moment actually occur. I'd declared people dead mm-hmm. and stood there. Mm-hmm. And so I knew exactly what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And did Ruth feel powerless by this, this lack of knowledge? Um, I think she felt a little, I don't think she felt powerless through the lack of knowledge because I think she felt she had a pretty good grasp of what was going on. She definitely also sensed that there was something else going on that she didn't quite grasp, that she didn't quite have full knowledge of. And that was a very difficult um, feeling to uh, assuage. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, you know, I hope I never go through something like this again. 
uh, but there are aspects of it I could have done better, and that's probably one of them. I was trying to find better or smarter ways to bridge that gap. But the other thing is I was paralyzed by fear mm -hmm. in so many ways that, you know, I can look back, it's now three years, I can look back rationally and say, oh, I should have done this, I should have handled this this way. But at the time, it was the combination of the clarity with which I knew what was going to happen and the fear of confronting it was, you know, pretty paralyzing, those two things together. Yeah, sounds like it. You wrote in one of your columns, uh, I knew more than I should. Did this ever help you, or is this the type of situation where ignorance may have been bliss? Uh, so mechanically, on the day-to-day -day stuff, obviously my medical knowledge helps, helped a lot. Like, okay, you have this going on, I know which doctor. Right. The fact that I was a doctor at Sloan Kettering meant that that doctor would email me back or call me back immediately. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that the... It, it could have gone many different ways, but the, the chasm between my knowledge and hers was bad for us as a couple. Um, but if we had both been more naive, I think that can fuel a different kind of anxiety mm -hmm. about not knowing and not being anchored and what are we missing and what could we be doing. And I think I've seen people who sort of where no one is anchored to what's actually going on, almost like verge on, on I don't want to say hysteria, but just sort of a, a, a steady state of panic um, that it might have been better for us as a couple, as a unit, mm -hmm. but not better for her actually, mm -hmm. because it would have been sort of bouncing off the walls with no purpose. So I don't know, none of it's good. Um, the whole experience was bad. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I can't say, like, given a different set of facts in my background, sure. better off, worse off, would she have been better off, worse off? It's, it's not totally clear. You write several times in your column that um, you were often not in the same place. Uh, you know, one thing I remember is you were talking about when she was first diagnosed and she wanted to tell people and, and you wanted to keep it more secretive. And, and so how do you reconcile that when couples are not in the same place? And is there ever, in that dance that we do in marriage, is there ever a way to kind of come to a happy medium or is it that the patient kind of trumps the situation? Yeah, so, you know, in a marriage you learn a lot about yourself. And if you're lucky enough to be married to somebody who's a hundred times smarter than you in every respect, like I was, uh, you know, you're stupid if you don't do a lot of listening. She was right and I was wrong. And it's that simple. Um, and I don't know how to intervene into other people's marriages. I wouldn't go yeah. about that business. But, uh, you know, she completely owned her experience. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of my time wishing it weren't happening, which was kind of stupid. And I don't remember if I wrote about it, but I remember I said to her many times that first day, like, I just want to wake up again and start over to this day. And I think I said it maybe the third or fourth time. She's like, don't ever say that again. You know, and part of it was the repetitive just be quiet, which I've lived through for decade right. plus, you know, right. of marriage. But part of it was like, stop. Mm -hmm. Just, this is our reality. This is our reality. You know, and each time you say that, you're basically saying, I can't help you in reality land mm -hmm. because I'm still trying to not be here. Mm -hmm. um, but no, she was absolutely right. She's like, of course we tell our friends, like, this is what they're for. Then she's brutally logical about, we'll never be able to keep all the lies straight, right? And like, and not like it wasn't a big deal, but at some level, like, what's the big deal? Like, this isn't, this is awful, it's tragic, but it's nothing, there's no shame. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to hide about it. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, it was just like, she was right. I was just being stupid. I was being cowardly. This is why I think, like, we're a little bit, too cautious with patients. We're a little bit too confident that they don't want information that they actually do. They've, they've carried their entire life to that moment where they're with us and we have this bad news that they don't know. And then suddenly we're the experts in how they should figure out what the next step of their life is, having met them for a few seconds and sometimes not even realizing they don't speak English. And, you know, that it's, it's not, 
it's not because of paternalism. It's because we don't, nobody wants to be in that situation. We're like, hi, nice to meet you. You have a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. But that's actually our job. Mm -hmm. And it's a little naive to think that people walk in and we can size them up and mm -hmm. figure out how to give them that information. What do you do as a provider? If you can put that hat back on for a second, when the patient and the partner may not be in the same place. I guess your job is the patient, right? But Well, yeah, I mean, you certainly don't want to get in the middle of it. Uh, but yeah, I think that your job is, is to like dealing with the person who brings their whole life history and their whole version of owning their own life and trajectory with them. The couple, the family, they bring all of that with them. And you can try and mediate, but I actually think, I don't want to use the word interesting because it sounds so dispassionate, but I've always found interpersonal interactions within families around crises very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so many things you see and you're like, I know what you were like as a five-year-old, you know, sort of, and that's not an insult. You can just see the inter-sibling dynamics and things. And, you know, being in the ICU and talking to people by end of life and DNR, you see a lot of this stuff come out and I've always felt like the best route, and I was always taken is, I don't, I can't manage these. I don't understand this well enough. I don't know anyone here, but I know that my job is to convey the truth mm -hmm. as best as I understand it, right? And I don't have perfect knowledge, but, and there's a lot going on, but I don't assist it by trying to add another level of opacity. So, yeah, I think the job is sort of just advance the actual facts mm -hmm. into whatever is going on in terms of interpersonal mm -hmm. dynamics. And yeah, absolutely, the patient carries the day mm -hmm. in all those interactions. Uh, I spend a lot of time, even now, talking to family members and people who are ill because by dint of friendships and relationships, I find myself in those conversations a lot. Uh, and also because I've been pretty open about what the experience is like as a caregiver, uh, people reach out to me. And it's, uh, there's a lot of layers of people trying to protect one another. And that's normal and to be expected and part of what my experience was as well. And I don't see a role for the provider being adding yet another layer and buffer to that. Because we actually can't be that helpful in that sense. Yeah. At what point in your column you say, you were talking about Ruth, before this, um, when you were talking about having a recurrence before when she was first diagnosed, and he said, it doesn't matter, it will either happen or it won't. And he asked if you'll live any differently. Looking back, do you think that was the right approach? It was, and it, it was one of those moments where I, I was sitting there and I was like, I have got to write about this because Again, you know, here I'm not even talking in that column about the, the odd experience of being a patient or the spouse of a patient instead of a doctor in my hospital. I'm talking about something that I do work in, in this case, you know, epidemiologic outcomes research, chance of recurrence given in adjuvant therapy or not. And he formulated the notion, the question about the probability of recurrence in a way that I had never thought about because I think about these things statistically mm -hmm. and in terms of populations. And being sitting there, there was no populations, there were no statistics, there were just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And it was really jarring, just mm -hmm. like I said, for him to say, that number doesn't matter because it's a, I'll be statistical for a second, it's not a probability, it's a binary event. It right. will happen, it won't. Why do you want to know about it? And any number of people, maybe most people would respond to that and say, how dare you keep a piece of information from me that is my right to know. And he acknowledged, I said, look, if you push me, I'm gonna tell you mm -hmm. this number. I can calculate it, mm -hmm. no problem. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of this deeply philosophical moment about illness and death and being human and about the risks we face that we can control and we can't control. 
And he was completely right. It was like, wait a second, that actually doesn't matter. This thing is going to happen. It's not. In fact, in our case, it did. And nothing about life was affected by it, except the probability that we'd see 2010 or mm -hmm. 2020 or whatever. And we couldn't do anything about it. It wasn't like, and I think it's crystal clear the way I explained it, he, it wasn't like we had a therapeutic decision to make. It wasn't like, mm -hmm. well, if you have this treatment, you change it probably by 4%. Right. That's a different conversation. I mean, no, no one would countenance hiding information. Mm -hmm. It was purely like, we are going down this road. These are the treatments you're going to get. And the probability of recurrence is knowable and irrelevant. I and I thought it was so life-affirming. Mm -hmm in my own domain, like statistics, mm -hmm. to see them that way, to realize what it was he was doing, that he was in the business of taking care of us, not populations, and in the business of communicating information in a way that we could best take it with us in terms of its more existential meaning. Mm -hmm. It was it was one of the few moments that I was just like, wow, I, my eyes just got opened. Mm -hmm. And it's why, I mean, it's why I wrote about it. And I tried to explain the arguments. And I'm sure many people read it. And I saw some of the comments. People were like, I totally disagree. He should have told you. And I've had people still to this day say, I hand every one of my patients with breast cancer that column when they ask me that question. Wow. And he didn't close, like I said, he didn't close the door. He asked us to think about it. Mm -hmm. And... When I thought about it, I said, right, this is about walking out of here and living our lives. And if this comes back, this beast, then we'll deal with that. And until then, we won't. And hopefully that we won't, we'll go on for the next 40 years. So that was your experience. How did Ruth take to that kind of information? She had a similar response. Really? She, okay. yeah, no, she, she hadn't really, gone through the mental exercise of what these numbers went, meant in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think she was a little jarred by it too, but then, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about it. I mean, but the first words I said to her when it's like, oh, he's right. Yeah. You know, like he, he's, he got it. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong. I think there are a couple of ways that people can go that, go down this road. Um, and to me, this really worked because it was so affirming of the part of life without the illness. Mm -hmm. um, that there wasn't a tick, 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 2%, a tick, 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 25%. Yeah. It wasn't. It's was like, yeah. we won't think about this again mm -hmm. until we have to. And, you know, she was on, she was ER positive, so she had tamoxifen. Right. So it wasn't like we were never going to, but it was just like, go on. They sort of putting the whole experience in the attic, you know, and it was a sort of an interesting metaphor. You know, like, not in the dumpster, still in your house, <laughs> up there where you never go with Candyland and yeah, old yeah, box of Monopoly of and stuff like that. It's still there. Just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of, I, I got that too, you know, like it's, you sort of had a frame of reference that worked for me. So it doesn't sound like you would have prioritized life any differently, given the odds. Or would you? No, and that was another thing, and again, I take it from my wife, but uh, she was a, you know, drink life to its lees kind of gal, and just, I mean, she was serious, she was professional, sure. she was, but she was not waiting around for anything. No, like, when we retire, we'll go to Italy, when we retire, we'll do these things, if we just do this thing, finally, then we'll do this. She was never like that. She was like, okay, I wake up today, and I'm going to go live my life, and she was always like that. And, and I talk about it in the article in New York Magazine. I mean, in the last months of her life, we, you know, went to Europe. We went to, you know, we burned through all the mileage we had. Mm -hmm. And we went and did the things that we would have done anyway, even more compressed. You know, off to Istanbul for my birthday, went to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. I wrote about the Istanbul. I think it didn't make the last cut. But, uh, you know, we went to Paris right before she died. Mm -hmm. You know, so she was... prioritize the things that were important. No, we would have done it anyway. We would have done it anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, by the time she had metastatic advanced disease and stuff, no, there was a, there was a sense of urgency. 
Um, but it went in completely the opposite direction of what it might have, which was, let's go do these things. And I, I mentioned in the column, but when she wanted to go to the Caribbean, I did. I said, oh my God, well, you know, what if something happens? And she was like, you know, and I wrote it in words there, but I mean, she just gave me that look of like, what could go wrong that hasn't already? Sort of like, yes, I could die in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Was she able to, to pass away with no regrets at the end, saying that she had done everything that she wanted to do in that last year? Oh, it's not a conversation we ever had. Really? No, and it's not a... Uh, I mean, I think for her, and I kind of think for me philosophically, life is a sort of never-ending or renewing resource, mm -hmm. right? And it sort of it goes until it doesn't. Right. And so, you know, the whole, like, bucket list, stuff like that, that seems like crap to me. Mm -hmm. Like, you, or at least the way I've tried to approach my life is just sort of like, I'm going to go do the things or be the person I want to be or achieve the things or interact or, you know, when I can. And then someday death or disability will take away my ability to do that. Mm -hmm. So she didn't sort of say, okay, I've got this list. I can guarantee you she would tell you, no matter what she had accomplished in her life, that she had a lot more she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it is the greatest sadness, persistent sadness in my life, not that I miss her, which I do terribly. And not, you know, the, my son lost his mother, which is this curse. But uh, that life is keeping hap keeps happening, and she would have loved to have been part of it and seen it. Mm -hmm. Like little things and big things, like with my family, with a great movie that comes out, with a cool event that happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I look at those things always like, she would have loved this. Mm -hmm. You know, like even, like, even minor things. You know, like, that's too bad. That's what she would have liked doing. She would have liked this sunset. She would have, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Like, that sucks. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is, that's the sort of persistent, like, the rest of it's just sort of real life, that I don't have her, my sure. son doesn't have her. That's the blocking and tackling of, of adulthood. Right. But that's the thing. She, she would have never said, oh, yeah, I've seen enough sunsets now. I'm good. Not sure you ever do, right? I hope not. Yeah. God forbid you never see one of them and pay attention, but. Yeah, and as I was reading your columns, um, one of the things that I felt like was so, almost a dagger through my heart, you said um, our life together was gone and carrying on without her, with exactly that, without her. I was reminded when our friend Liz insights after she lost her husband to melanoma, she told me she had plenty of people to do things with, but nobody to do nothing with, which just yeah. brought to, I mean, that is just so hard to kind of swallow. And my question for you in that kind of reading back your quote is, what does healing look like now that you're a couple years past your passing? Yeah, that's a great line. That was really, yeah. Um, uh, you're asking me to sort of take stock of the last three years. And the one thing that's clear to me is that I've already gone through so many states mm -hmm. of grief and mourning and living life and those being intermingled that I, I have no idea how many are ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Each time I get somewhere, I'm like, okay, now I know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Now I know where I am. And then I'm not there anymore. And so, I wish I had good insight, and I got zero. I'm like one foot in front of the other, mm -hmm. finding joy in things when I can, mm -hmm. trying to make good decisions. You know, as a father, you know, and professionally, and just, I, I kind of figure like everything's been upended to some extent that will never, the, you know, the, the wobbly will never stop wobbling. Mm -hmm. And just like, the magnitude of its, of its excursion will slowly diminish, and that'll be it. You know, until it's imperceptible, or maybe not. So has it gotten easier, or just different? Uh, um, easier. Okay. Uh, but omnipresent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but I've got stuff I have to do. 
you know? I have a life I'm supposed to lead. And uh, I have things that I have to do for the people in my family. Mm -hmm. And the one thing Ruth would have been really pissed about is if I had retreated from that mm -hmm. because of this. I'm Did pretty sure she wanted me to go out and be the person I was when she met me. Didn't sound like you had the option to crawl into bed and not come out with your son and work and it sounds like you had to keep putting one foot in front of the other as, even as hard as it was or as hard as it is. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I think that would have been my first instinct, just like anybody's, you know, or Ruth always said, go get a loft in Paris and get tuberculosis and have somebody write an opera about you. But, uh, the, yeah, the, that was, you know, those sort of stabilizing necessities are good, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I had, you know, my personal and family responsibilities were the dominant ones. My hospital was wonderful. I think mm -hmm. I could have disappeared for as long as I needed to, mm -hmm. but they were totally there for me. Well, um, thanks very much for reading my stuff and thanks for inviting me to talk about it. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. This has been great. And thank you for joining us.